Welcome and thank you for joining us. It's time to rethink the purpose of the church. The church is more than attending a service, giving an offering, or singing songs. In this series, we will examine the five purposes of the church, which meet our deepest human needs. So join us as we discover how worship, community, discipleship, ministry, and evangelism change us and the world we live in. Please fill a connect card on our website or download our app if you would like us to reach out to you. see y'all out today we had a baptism to kick things off and elizabeth is about the sweetest thing you'll ever meet i'm telling you right now if you don't get a chance to say hi to her you should because she is precious and her family here welcome her family welcome all our guests we are glad that you all are here welcome our online audience glad that you're here too we wish you were in person but wherever you're at we hope god blesses you give us a thumbs up if you're watching and uh just we're just excited we're in this series uh, rethink the church where we're looking at the purposes of the church there are five we're examining and here's the important part they meet the deepest need of every human the church meets these deep deep needs 1995 it was about 1 30 in the morning I was coming home from work just finished second shift and uh, as I got ready to turn left up my road Ivy Ridge Road on top of Bent Mountain I looked to the right, and there was a car overturned, the roof was crushed, there was glass everywhere, and I thought, oh, wow, I wonder when this happened. So I turned around, came back just to check things out, and the wheels were still turning, and the exhaust was still very hot. And so I looked up underneath the car, and there was a young lady, <clears throat> she had just got off her work, uh, her, she was a waitress at a, at a restaurant downtown, and uh, I reached up, and, I, and she's kind of barely conscious, you know, and I unhook her seatbelt and slide her out and get her out through the glass and she's bleeding profusely from her forehead and, and from her hands and things and it wasn't long before the police and the rescue squad showed it up showed up and and took care uh, of business took her to the hospital and all that type of thing now I'll never forget that night it's unforgettable to me and anyone who's been work in a rescue squad or police or military and they've been involved in a rescue situation or helping somebody who's in a desperate need you know what I'm talking about we remember helping people in desperate need and one of the reasons we do is because you're designed to do that we are designed to help people to bring people out of out of darkness or out of bondage or out of difficulty or through a difficult situation, God created us to love one another. And so, so one of the things that comes from doing those, in those situations is you feel good about yourself and you don't forget about it. It's an unforgettable moment. Some people try to build legacy in their life by writing a book or building a building or creating something named after them, but all of those things will pass away but what we do in Christ for others is eternal. It leaves an eternal legacy. And so if you really want to have a lasting legacy, if you really want to make a difference eternally, bring someone else into the fellowship of God's family. It is a beautiful thing, and you will never forget it. And so today we're going to talk about this fourth purpose of the church, evangelism. And I know you're all excited about going out and telling everybody about your faith. I know, it's intimidating. It's intimidating to talk about Jesus in our world today, but the world has never needed Jesus more than today. And so we started out looking at the importance of worship and how worship echoes uh, God's love in us and how we lift God up and, and all the things. If you missed that sermon, I hope you go back and, and watch it. And then we talked about community. We talked about the importance of uh, uh, of being in, in, in like fellowship and walking with other people in Jesus and how isolation 
crushes us and isolation is the very thing that destroys so many people's lives. And we talked about service last week. Today we're talking about evangelism. What is evangelism? Sharing our love for God and the hope in Jesus with others. It's that simple. It's that simple. It's not, it's not something like sharing some, uh, answer some deep theological question, although that might be involved in some conversations. Most of the time, it's just talking about how God has loved us and the hope we have in Jesus. We live in a very unpredictable world. And this COVID virus that's been global and now is rising up again around different parts of the world lets people know if you're counting on things to remain the same, you're counting the wrong things. This world is unpredictable and this world needs an anchor and the only anchor that's eternal is Jesus. And so I hope that we are learning to how to share God's love and encourage others to follow him. I wish sharing our faith was as easy as sharing things on social media. You know, right? Wouldn't it be great? You know, you get those funny jokes, you know, and, and videos, and sometimes somebody sends you a scripture, and it's, it's, it's on some beautiful background, and that's cool. I love all that stuff, but it's not that easy, is it? And, and, and sharing things on social media is not what Jesus modeled, because you see, Sharing God's love will eventually involve a conversation and a relationship with another human. In the Old Testament, there's a story where the Israelites, the Hebrew children, they're in bondage to Pharaoh. They come out of that bondage. They come to Mount Sinai, and God comes down on a mountaintop. Moses goes up there, and he receives the law, the Decalogue, the Ten Laws, and then there were other laws to follow. But God put his expectations for living and a relationship with him in writing, and you know how it worked out? Not so great. I mean, there were times where people would follow, but then they would fall away. And God had always designed to have a relationship with humans. And the way he did that after the fall was God put on flesh and bone. We call him Jesus. And he came into our earth and he showed us what the law looks like in flesh and blood. He modeled what love was. He modeled what forgiveness was. And he gave us a realistic expectation and understanding of who God was because he walked among us. And so we can't grasp love until it's modeled in front of our eyes. It really does take examples like that. Jesus came to seek and save lost people by proclaiming the good news of freedom from sin. Recovery from brokenness, release from Satan, and gain the Lord's favor, enabling believers to immediately experience kingdom life and to gain the hope of eternal life in the fully consummated kingdom by means of his death and resurrection. This is a big explanation, and if this is your first time to church, a cornerstone, you're like, what did he just say? It is a big explanation, but but what I'm saying is, Jesus didn't come just to make people feel good, although Jesus makes me feel good. Jesus didn't come just to help people work through some problems. Jesus came to rescue lost people and bring them from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. It is a transference of residence. And so Jesus, he showed compassion to people in his daily life, and he sought a spiritual conversation with those people. He would say things like this. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. He said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And he said, unless you repent, you too will likewise perish. Jesus gave wonderful stories that encouraged people and made people feel like God was close. But he also called people to make a decision on what he was talking about. He called anyone to listen to him to make a decision because their destiny depended upon what they would decide. You're the captain of your ship and the choices you make determine where you will land. And it's up to us to make a decision about Jesus. He called the rich young ruler to sell everything he had and follow him. Go sell the Porsche. Go sell the house. Go sell the retreat place down at the lake. Go sell everything. Sell your Learjet. Sell it all and come follow me. 
He, 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 he called those people who, who were distant from him to come into relationship. He, they, he met this Samaritan woman. She'd been married five times. She was living with a guy that wasn't her husband. And he said, I'm going to offer you living water. You'll never thirst again. That dryness in your soul where you're trying to fill it with sex with, and all these things. I will give you something that will meet a deepest need of your life. And it's me, a relationship with me. He said to the crowds, the crowds that would follow him, big crowds, because what do crowds do? They look for a show. And so Jesus performed miracles, and people were like, hey, these lepers are clean, and this dead man walks, and, and look, he fed all these thousands of people with this young boy's lunch. And, and so people were looking for a show. And Jesus said to this crowd, he said, if anyone would come after me, if anyone wants to follow me, they must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But who who wants to forfeit his life for my sake will save it. Just to be clear, in case you don't understand what I'm, about, what I'm talking about, Jesus called on individuals to make decisions that would direct their destinies. You and I are making decisions every day. And the decisions we make have consequences. And so we want to make decisions that bring about the best possibilities in our life. And when people refused Jesus' invitation to follow him, and many did. Let me just say that again. Most did. If you're struggling with a decision to follow Jesus, you're in a category that's larger than those who've chosen to follow. It's a struggle. <laughs> there is no easy way to put it, but following Jesus has immense blessings, eternal destiny, but it is difficult and it is hard to live in the footsteps of Jesus because this world is opposed to Christian living and there is an enemy trying to destroy our faith and we start out handicapped because of what Adam and Eve did. It's difficult. It broke Jesus' heart. One time, close to the end of his life, he says to Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, this is the, the, the people of God, the Jews at that time. He says, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. <laughs> that was a reputation. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects the chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. And now look, your house is abandoned and desolate. For I tell you this, you will never see me again until you say blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. He's talking about his return second return. Jesus is coming back. But he knew what was going to befall Jerusalem in 70 AD, the worst disaster to fall any city in ancient times happened to Jerusalem. It was a decimation of the people and they were dispersed never to gather again. And so Jesus says, I wish you would have responded to my invitation. I wish you would have made a decision. I wish you could have pushed aside about what other people thought about you. And I wish, I wish you could have overcome your, your, your weaknesses just to, to, to let me be your strength. Jesus was compassionate to sinners. He loves sinners. He often sought table fellowship with outcasts. And that brought a lot of harsh criticism to him. Because he was having dinner with prostitutes. And tax collectors who had sold out to the Roman Empire to extort their own people. Jesus had supper with them. And the religious insiders called Pharisees hated him for it. But Jesus came to seek and save the lost. That's why he came. And so Jesus responded to the critics by telling them stories. We call them parables. The word parable is a compound Greek word. Para, meaning alongside. And so Jesus would tell a spiritual truth alongside an earthly story. And so he told them three stories that are very famous about this mission that he had to seek and save the lost. He told them about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep and one wandered off. And he went and found that one and brought him home on his shoulders. And he called all his friends to celebrate. Rejoice with me, the one has been found. And then he told the story of a woman who had ten coins, and she lost one. And she tore her house apart until she found it. And when she found that lost coin, she invited her neighbors over to celebrate. 
And then he told them the story that just turned their world upside down about a man who had two sons, and one of those sons said, Dad, I'm giving you the middle finger. I wish you were dead. I want my inheritance, and I'm out of here. And he left, and he went to Las Vegas, and he blew all his money, and he ruined his life. And he's about to die eating hog's feed, and he says, maybe my dad would let me be a servant. At least I could survive. And when he came home, the father was looking for him to arrive And when he saw him, he gathered up his cloak and ran to him and embraced him and had a party for his return. And nobody in that crowd could even conceive of a father humbling himself to a lost son like that. But that's who Jesus is. He loves lost people. And the righteous, he can't do much with them. If you think you're good enough for God, he can't do much for you. But if you know your life is ripped up and broken by the consequences of your decisions, Jesus says, I'll be your friend. I love you. And so a sheep, a coin, a son, meaning everyone has a place in Jesus' kingdom. And until a person is rescued, they do not have a relationship with Jesus. Listen to me clearly. Until you are abiding with Jesus, you are in the lost category. There are two classifications of humanity, saved and lost. All the other classifications are lesser down the line of importance. And so before Jesus returned home to the Father, after his death, burial, and resurrection, he ascends to heaven. And he does this in front of witnesses. And he gives, this, he gives this baton, this missional baton. He hands that off to those who are following him. He said, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Do you know the only command in all the Bible done in all three parts of the Godhead, the authority of God, is to baptize people into Jesus? What you witness today with Elizabeth's baptism is done in all three parts of the Godhead. That means God has authorized this to happen. And when she makes a decision, God moves and all the angels rejoice when people come home. I'm excited. I hope you are. I think I'm preaching better than you're listening. So come on, get some coffee, and let's go. Wherever you go, you're supposed to talk about how much God loves you and what he's done in your life. And I don't mean to be weird, but we have an opportunity at the YMCA, at the grocery store, going to school, wherever we go, the soccer field, we should be mindful that there are people out there that are saved or lost, and maybe, maybe we'll have a conversation to encourage someone to think about Jesus, to consider going to church, to think about spiritual things. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5, 12, uh, 5, 20 through 21. He says, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making an appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead. Come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be, a, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God to Christ. Do you understand what Jesus has done for the world? He became the payment you and I can't pay. One of my favorite definitions of what the gospel is. God made Christ who never sinned to be the sin offering for me. For me and you. What's an ambassador? An ambassador is one who is somebody who's a representative of a higher power. They come with authority. They come with a message from the king. And that that invitation makes a difference in people's lives when they respond. My dad was a metallurgical engineer with Alcoa Aluminum in the late 50s. He's at his desk at his office at the Alcoa plant in Maryville, Tennessee, and a guy walks up to him and invites him to a men's Bible study. My dad says, what's that? We'll come and see. And so my dad come and saw. (laughs) Some English teacher out there, your skin just crawled. So, So anyway... 
uh, because of that invitation, my dad made a decision. He decided to follow Jesus. Then he led his family to Jesus. And the reason I stand before you here today is because someone decided to talk about Jesus to my dad. Amen. Do you understand how simple it is, how profound an impact it has for eternity, for generations? And so sharing Jesus changes the world we live in. People say, we heard this at Ignite this past week, uh, people say we've got problems with race and problems with gender and problems with politics. We've got a sin problem. And the solution is Jesus. And it's just that simple. Sharing Jesus changes your world. But it's hard to talk about Jesus. It just is. I'm a professional Christian and I struggle with it. That means I get paid to talk about Jesus. You know, okay, some of you, you're slow on the uptake. But you know what? Come back next week and you'll hear the same joke again. <laughs> and you'll laugh. All right, so let's, let's talk about this. Let's talk about like overcoming the insecurity to talk about Jesus. Here's a few things to consider. Know this, people are interested in spiritual things. Ecclesiastes says this, he planted, meaning God planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. If you go into, if you can find a bookstore today, like a Barnes and Noble, and you go into that bookstore, the largest section of books is the spiritual section. Now, it's all kinds of spirituality, but my point is, people are interested in spiritual things, but oftentimes ignorant of the truth about spiritual things things. Look, here's an apologetic defense of God and Jesus, right? I'm making an apology. I'm making a verbal defense of why I believe in God and why I think Jesus is the answer. Are you ready? If you're a doubter, if you're a newcomer to this thing, faith, God created a corresponding satisfaction for every human desire. You get hungry, there's food. You get dry mouth, there's water. You have sexual desires, there's marriage. God created a satisfaction for every human desire. And you know what? Mankind is hopelessly religious. Mankind wants to know about God. They have interest in God. If they can't figure out who God is, they'll create their own God. And so humans try to satisfy the spiritual hunger with uh, with different things. They try to find, satisfy the spiritual hunger with sex or status or money or possessions. But only God can satisfy this deep spiritual hunger. And you know, loneliness or guilt or shame or fear of something or some physical need or relational need or financial crisis that happens in someone's life often becomes the door opener for that person to have a spiritual conversation. And so when people are hurting and broken, they often have some desire to talk about something that will meet this deep spiritual need. And when it comes to spirituality, as I said before, most people don't know what they're talking about. And I, don't, I'm not, I didn't. We, we really don't know. Oftentimes we don't know. And, and we need coaching and we need mentoring. But only Jesus can satisfy this spiritual hunger. Now, a lot of people equate Jesus with other spiritual leaders. And let me just be clear. There is no comparison. There is no comparison. Buddha claimed to point the way to God. Muhammad claimed to be a prophet of God. But Jesus Christ is the only major religious leader that ever claimed to be God who lived a sinless and miraculous life fulfilled prophecy written hundreds of years before he was born. And then he died on a cross and rose from the dead and witnessed by over 500 people. The most documented fact of all history is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know more about his resurrection than we know about the president of the United States. The first president of the United States. What I'm saying is this historical fact changes the way you date your checks. It's changed the course of history. And there are more Christians that live on the earth than any other religious brotherhood. And so... We have a Jesus who's uncommon when compared to all other religious leaders. But it's, it's hard to share your faith. I get it. I understand. But remember this, evangelism is a process. The Apostle Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 3, 6. He said, I, Paul, planted the seed in your hearts 
and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. So, so, so it's, it's not all up to us to bring people into the family of God, but we have a part in that. We have a role in that. Bringing a believer, an unbeliever, to faith involves more than one person. And know this, God does the heavy lifting. When you decide to follow Jesus, there's a conviction in you and you've got to do something about it. You've got to do something about it. You've got to talk to somebody. You've got to be baptized. You've got to turn from this. Whatever it might, you know that you like. You feel that conviction. That's God at work. And when you feel bad about the things that you do that you know are wrong, that's God at work. The Spirit of God is convicting us of sin. Jesus illustrated this, this process of evangelism through a parable of the soil. So he, he talks this, he uses this story that farmers would understand. He's talking to a, an agriculture community. And, and everybody's tied to the land some way. And so he tells a story of a farmer who liberally casts his seed upon the ground. Some of it goes in the, uh, on the field. Some of it goes on the road. Some of it goes up in the thorns and the rocks. And he tells this parable to illustrate this is what the gospel... The gospel just goes out and people talk about it. And we don't, we don't always understand where it's going to land. And we don't know what type of soil or heart it's going to land on. But God will give an increase to the, to the, good, to the so, uh, seeds that land on the good soil. So the seed in the parable represents the gospel. And the soil in the parable represents the condition of the human heart. And the good soil receives the seed and it grows. And so the, these four basic spiritual condition, conditions Jesus is, is talking about here... And he tells this parable to the crowd, and his disciples are kind of hanging around, and they're slow. <laughs> they're slow. And he sees the question marks on their face, and so after the crowds are kind of dispersing, he turns to his disciples and he says, let me slow down and go over this one more time with you all. <laughs> the seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. The evil one, the devil, Satan, comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or they're persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced. The seed that fell on the good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 60, 30, 60, or even 100 times as much has been planted. I, I know I am presenting the gospel. I am casting the seed on every heart here and every heart listening. It's God to give the increase, but you have a responsibility on how you receive it. And my prayer is, that you would receive it in a good heart and allow God to increase your faith. I've looked at this parable many times. I've heard it preached on many times. It's a great parable. And I've kind of come to this generalization, a conclusion of why one heart receives it and the other three types don't. And so here's my generalization. It's a distorted understanding about themselves, about God the Father and Jesus Christ, that prevents a non-believer's heart from receiving the gospel. The distorted, distorted, distorted view of God. Who is God? God is holy. We see this over and over again. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. What is holy? It's the transcendent nature of God. It's the purity of God. It's God is completely happy with himself. Have you ever had one of those moments where you go, man, I wish I wouldn't have said that? Or have you ever had one of those moments, I wish I wouldn't have done that, or I wish I would have done that? God never says that. He's completely happy with who he is. He's completely whole and complete. That's how he can offer wholeness and complete us. He's lacking in nothing. God is, is not just an elevated human like the Greek or the Roman gods that we read about in history. God is the creator and sustainer of all things. Most people don't have a concept of the holiness of God. His perfect nature. And, and most people don't understand who Jesus is. They don't understand that he did not come just to 
make us feel better. He didn't, he didn't come just to tell good stories. He came to rescue people who are drowning in sin and bring them to eternal life. And he's come to rescue people. And then lastly, most people don't understand their state. For whatever reason, especially in our culture, we think we can fix it ourselves. We've got all these YouTube videos, you know. Are you doing that now? I am all the time. Almost on everything. How do I cook bacon? You know, like, I mean, we, like, I wonder if somebody's got a better way. You know, we, we pull up the bit, And there's, within us, fostered within our culture, is this idea that you and I can fix ourselves. But we can't. You and I absolutely are dependent upon outside help. Let me illustrate it this way. This is you. This is sin. This is Jesus. When you were born, you were absolutely pure and adorable. Your mommy and daddy and grandpa and papa, uh, grandma and grandpa, and they loved you so much. They said things like this. I could just drink them up. Right? You were so beautiful. But sin enters our life at some point in time. We call that the age of accountability. There comes a point in time where we understand the right and the wrong of life. Not just with mom and dad, but with God, with a creator, with we understand that there is something wrong with us. And so we dive into some type of sin. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's lying. Maybe it's cheating. Maybe it's uh, not doing what we should. Maybe it's far worse than that. Maybe it's adultery. Maybe, I don't know what it is. But at some point in life, sin enters our life and it makes us dirty. It makes us dirty. And we're no longer pure. Our lives have been fouled by sin. Do you understand this? And so now our heart, our mind is filled with shame, guilt, rage, anger, depression. And, you know, you try to drink it away, you try to smoke it away, you try to sleep it away, you try to whatever it away, and it doesn't go away. And hopefully at some point in time, somebody tells you about Jesus and you allow, you ask, you beg, you plead for Jesus to come into your life. And Jesus comes into your life and he makes you clean again. You cannot do this on your own. You're, de you're totally dependent upon Jesus to clean you up from the inside out. Going to church will not save you. Just doing good things won't save you. Your heart has to be reconditioned, remade through the work of Christ. I have even better news than that. The sin that affects the whole world. The sin that is destroying people's lives right now all over the world. People are going to an eternity without Jesus because of sin. The consequences of sin. Jesus died on a cross. And there he took on the sin of all humanity. He dealt with all of it. And when by faith you decide to follow Jesus and trust him. He saves you. Amen. This is the good news. This is what everybody needs to hear. They need to see Jesus and you're it. And I'm it. And how we act and how we talk and how we walk is what people see. People would rather see a sermon than hear one. And you're probably saying amen to that right now even if you're not saying it. So, how do you share your faith? Four simple steps. There are more than this. But this is... Often what I think about when I think about evangelism. Number one, listen to their story. Shut your mouth long enough to hear what's going on in their life. I'm not trying to be offensive, but here's what I know. You and I are not born good listeners. We're born good complainers. 
What's the first thing a baby does? They cry. Because there's something's on their bottom end or they're hungry. They're uncomfortable, so they cry. You have to learn to listen. And you reflect what you hear a person say. And so that person says to you something, and you say something back like, I think you're telling me that you're feeling very isolated right now or very unloved. I think you're telling me you feel betrayed. A very, very hurt. You, you listen to their story. You, sh- you show empathy, maybe even sympathy. You share your stories. The reason I use plural is everybody has a testimony who follows Jesus. Everybody has that moment where they come to Jesus. Yes. But then we have other stories where when we decided that we put God first in our finances, we no longer had to worry about our finances all the time. When we put God first in our marriage, guess what? Things got healed. When we put God first in, in how we raised our kids or what we did, in the, like we have stories. And you're very interesting people because I've heard so many of your stories and I'm like, I'll go home and tell my lovely wife. I say, lovely wife. I have to share this with you. Guess what this person told me? And I go, oh, that's amazing. I, that's so cool. Let's record that. Let's let everyone know. We have stories of how God's worked in our life. And that is a powerful testimony that God is real. And he's active and wanting to work in the lives of people. And then pray with them and pray for them. What I mean by this is, Learn how to pray with somebody. Okay, I'm going to teach you how it goes. Here it is. Ready? It's really hard. I'm going to show you how it's done. You ready? You might write this down. All right? Here we go. Father, help them find you. Amen. There you go. It's not hard. What are we doing? We're invoking God's power and presence into their life to help them. And you can't figure it out. I can't figure it out. We can't solve it. God is their Savior. We are not. We are simply carrying, we're broken vessels filled with living water carrying it to them. And then invite them to worship. Invite them to worship. This is a great church. And you should always come here any opportunity you have. And I'm not saying that because I'm the preacher. I'm saying that because this is a great church. Invite them to worship. Invite them to a Bible study. It changed my dad. Maybe it'll change you. Maybe it'll change your friends or your family or generations to come. It is so important for us to invite people to the table of God. Jesus told this story of a banquet. And he's mad or angry at the Israelites who refused his invitation to come. And he tells this story where he sends out servants to go invite them in, but they don't come in. And then he says, I want you to go back, and I want you to invite the prostitutes, the drunkards, the lepers, the poor. I want you to go find the most broken people you can find and invite them in, because I bet they'll come. You see, here's what I know. Because I know this about me, and it's probably true about you. You don't want to follow Jesus because you don't feel that broken. But life has a tendency to reveal to us through circumstances that show how badly we are broken. Mine came with an EKG on my heart. After snorting so much cocaine for a weekend at the race, I thought I was going to die. And the doctor said, son, there's nothing wrong with your heart. There's some kind of stress in your life. And I knew exactly what he was talking about. I had been running from God. And only God could save me. And I'll never forget that night either. We have a responsibility to tell the world about Jesus. When you walk out of here today... There's a sign that you'll walk under. And maybe you've noticed this, maybe you haven't, but it says entering the mission field. Where's the mission field? It's just outside these doors. It's the grass between your feet. It's wherever you go. Because there are lost people all around us. Most of our world has no hope.
most people have no idea who Jesus is. This is an outpost. This is a place where we're equipped, where we're challenged, where we're encouraged, where we meet other brothers and sisters in the Lord's army, and then we go out together, and by working together, we can make an eternal difference. As this, uh, as this time closes, I'm going to go back to the next step room. And if you want to talk about Jesus, I want to talk to you.